Today I'm going to start a topic that I, is very appropriate and applicable for the period of time that we're living in. When you see all the destruction, all the collapse of society, all the prevailing of evil, there are only a few things in our lives that we should be focusing on. Well, maybe even only one thing that we should be focusing on. And hopefully we can talk about that today. Uh, there, will be, there will probably be at least two sermons... Uh, that, that come out of this topic. And the overall arching topic is dress reform for judgment. How are we going to be dressed on our judgment day? I think it's very important. We love dress reform in the Reformed Church, so I'm going to go into it all the way from length to dress, everything. It'll be important. But with, with some humor there, um, part one is going to be or is entitled today, Naked and Afraid at the Wedding Feast. Uh, Matthew 22, let's turn to Matthew 22. We all know this story. In fact, this story is mentioned various ways in the Gospels. Today we'll focus on Matthew 22, and I'll just read a little bit from Matthew 22, verses 2 through 10. It'll be in the English Standard Version today. It says that there is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is talking to the disciples. It may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his sons. He sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention, and they went off, one to his farm, the other to his business, while the rest seized the servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops, and he destroyed the murderers and burnt their city. Then he said to his servant, The wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. I'm going to stop here, because Jesus has this story in various places, and in this particular story, the king sends his troops, and he destroys the people who were invited, and in the end here, he says that they were not worthy. They were invited, but they were not worthy to participate in the wedding feast. Who are these people when Christ is talking here? These are the people of God. The Jewish people, and Ellen White and commentators both agree that when the armies come to destroy their city, this is the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, because they rejected, they rejected multiple calls. They even split it up the first time, that's before Christ comes, and afterward, those are the people like Stephen, after uh, after Christ is risen and left, They're still calling the Jewish nation, come, come, come to the wedding feast. But they pay no heed, and the city is destroyed. And the declaration is said that they were not worthy. Now we go into the rest of of this section here. And in verse 9, Christ says, The king commands, Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. So the first group, they were not worthy. And then who comes here in the end? A mixed, a mixed group. Good people, bad people, everybody's invited. Everybody. This can be compared to the opening of the gospel to all the world, the opening of the kingdom of heaven to all the world after the Jewish nation rejected Christ. All were welcome. All had the invitation. Both bad and good were invited. Ellen White in Christ Object Lessons, which I recommend everyone read, Christ Object Lessons, the chapter, Without a Wedding Garment. She says at the first class, the Jewish nation could not afford, they thought, to sacrifice any worldly advantage for the sake of attending the king's banquet. Could we be like that today? All the worldly advantages we have, we, can't, we don't have the time, we, don't have, we can't afford 
the loss of income and money, to leave our worldly businesses, and to go to the king's banquet. She continues, and those who accepted the invitation were some who thought only of benefiting of themselves. This is the mixed multitude. Oh yeah, I'm homeless on the street and the king invited me in. Oh, I'm coming, I'm coming, this is good. They came to share in the provisions of the feast. Every now and then people ask, is potluck going to be served this Sabbath? And then, you know, there's a bigger, there's a bigger congregation on potluck Sabbaths, but when there's no potluck, you know, could, could this type of people be coming to the, to the wedding feast here? So they came to share in the provisions of the feast, but they had no desire to honor the king. Christ Object Lessons, page 309. Ellen White then continues in that chapter. She says, After the guests arrive for the feast, the real character and the real intentions of all the guests are revealed. Matthew 22, verses 11. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man with no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. The king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into utter darkness in a place that will be full of weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called and few are chosen. So I'd like us to focus on this last part here. This is the part that is important for us in this day and age. Ellen White says that this man came to the feast in common citizen dress. This is the dress reform, the dress reform for the wedding. She says he had refused to make the preparation required by the king. The garment provided for him at great cost he disdained to wear. Thus he insulted his Lord. What is this wedding garment that was requested of the king for the feast? The wedding garment in the parable represents the pure, spotless character which, with which Christ's true followers will possess. To the church is given that she should be arraigned in fine linen, clean and white, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Revelation 19 and Ephesians 5. It is the righteousness of Christ, his own unblemished character, that through faith is imparted to all who receive him as their personal savior. So why would a perfectly normal person dressed in decent clothes, street clothes, maybe they were even nice clothes, why would he want to change? He was already clothed. It wasn't like he was naked coming into the wedding garment, into the, into the wedding. He was dressed. This class, this man in this class of people, he presented himself to God for the wedding on his own terms. He felt that his dress was good enough. He was good enough to present himself to the wedding feast. Now, uh, the title of the sermon was what? Naked in the wedding, right? Naked and ashamed in the wedding. Well, he's clothed. What's the problem? What is the point of clothing in Scripture? And I think all through Scripture there are themes in the Bible. They go the whole way through. And if you just look at them, they're everywhere. Clothing and the righteousness of Christ is very, very important. So how did humanity begin? Did they begin with sewn clothes? They did not. So Christ Object Lessons, page 310. The white robes of innocence was worn by our first parents when they were placed, in God, uh, placed by God in Holy Eden. They lived a per in perfect conformity to the will of God. All their strength and their affections was given wholly to their Heavenly Father. And then it talks about the beautiful soft light of God enshrouding the holy pair. So the first clothes ever worn by humankind, what kind of clothes were they? They were the character 
of Christ. They were the wedding garment. That's what we officially had. We had the wedding garment. We had purity. We had perfect conformity to the character, to the law of Christ. But then what happens in this world? Sin enters into this world and it severs the connection with God. The light that encircled them departed. Naked and ashamed, they tried to supply in place of the heavenly garments by sewing together fig leaves for a covering. This is what the transgressors of God's law have done ever since the day Adam and Eve's uh, the day of Adam and Eve's disobedience. They have sewed together fig leaves to cover the nakedness caused by their transgression. They have worn the garments of their own devising. By works of their own, they have tried to cover their sins and make themselves acceptable to God. This is what this, is what this particular guest of the king, he was in his own works clothed in his own righteousness, and he thought he was acceptable. He was good enough. But you know what? It would have been better off had he been naked. There. Had he been naked at the wedding feast. Now, when you look at this form of dress reform, we've had it from the very beginning. Adam and Eve, they were naked and they put on leaves. Then an animal had to die that they may be clothed. And you go all the way to now even dress reform in our church. Could it be that we're just covering our nakedness with worldly clothes sewn on the loom of the devil? Doesn't matter how you wear your clothes. Could it be that we have it all wrong and we are presenting ourselves to God with our own works? We think we have covered our sins, we have covered our nakedness, and we've made ourselves acceptable to the king. Well, what does Isaiah 64, 6 say? Isaiah says that my own garment, it says of this, all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteousness, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. So nothing, nothing we can devise. We can look really good in church. We can have the longest dress or the longest sleeves. We can be buttoned up to the top and present ourselves to the king but we have lost our robe of innocence. No matter what leaves we wear, we will always be naked in the eyes of Christ. Now what does Revelation 3.18 say? What does Christ want of his people, the Laodicean people in the last day? I counsel, he says, of thee to buy of me white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So the robe of Christ, this white raiment, is woven in the loom of heaven. It has not one thread of human righteousness or devising. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character, and this character he offers to give to you and me. Again, Christ's object lessons, I want to read this, this section here to us, this paragraph. Ellen White says that when we submit ourselves to Christ, our heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind, and the thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed in the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, or then as God looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garments, not the nakedness and the deformity of our sins, but his own robe of righteousness, which is the perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. I think this is probably one of the key paragraphs in this chapter of Christ's Object Lessons. When we put on the garment of Christ, there is a blending. There is a blending of our will into His will. And because of this blending, everything that we have done in our, perf in our past life, because we have conformed to His mind, is no longer visible. God's eye, when the king goes in to look, 
He doesn't see. He doesn't see the sins. He doesn't see the past that we have. He sees only the righteousness of our Redeemer Christ. Now here's why this is also more important for us today. By the king's examination of the guests at the feast is represented the work of judgments. The guests at the gospel feast are those who profess to serve God, those whose names are written in the book of life, but not all who profess to be Christians are true disciples. You know, when the king's servants, when they went out into the highways and byways, not everybody came out of the highways and byways. Only those who were interested. Only those who said, okay, yeah, I'll be the guest. I'll be the guest of the king. So that group represents the people of Christ, the church. And, and it says specifically, if the first group was not worthy, this one was a mixed multitude of good and bad. And they're all in the church. They all come to the wedding. They all think they belong there. But not all of them belong there. Ellen White continues, before the final reward is given, it must be decided who are fitted to share in the inheritance of righteousness. This decision must be made prior to the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. Before this coming, the character of every man's work will have been determined. To every one of Christ's followers, the reward will have been apportioned according to his deeds. Before Christ comes, is there another chance? Just before he comes, the moment he's coming, is there another chance? It will have already been determined. Before the feast, the wedding feast, what is there? There is a judgment. The king comes and he investigates. There is an investigative judgment before the final serving of the, of the wedding feast. Brothers and sisters, do we believe that we're living in the end times? When you look at the way the world is right now, and we can get all caught up, we can get all caught up in the right and the wrong and the, and the, and the horror of this world, and it is indeed horrible. But the most important part now is, are we putting on the wedding garment of Christ? It is while men are dwelling on the earth that the work of investigative judgment takes place in the courts of heaven. The lives of all those who profess to be followers of Christ pass in review before God. All are examined according to the record of the books of heaven, according to his deeds. The destiny of each is forever fixed. He who becomes a partaker of the divine nature will be in harmony with God's great standard of righteousness, his holy law. This is the rule by which God measures the actions of men. This will be the test of character in the judgment. Are we ready? Are we ready to, to stand up here with the law against our character? How do we know where we are in the judgment? It starts with the righteous dead, but when does it come to those who are walking this earth today? How do we know if our character has not already been found wanting and truthfully we are naked? Or maybe we are dressed in our own righteousness, but in reality we are naked before the eyes of God. So what is the measuring rule that I just read by which humankind are found worthy to enter into heaven? Perfect obedience to the law of God. So this man without the wedding garment, would you say he's part of the minority or majority? You know, in the, in the, in the, in the verse, in the Bible verse, there says, it says there's only one man. But what does Christ say at the very end? In Matthew 22... 15, he says, for many are called, but few are chosen. You know, and I looked up this few are chosen. What does that mean? You know, there's a lot of good people out there and God only handpicks a, a handful. No, it says, you know, when you look at the SDA Bible commentary, it says here that Christ is stating the fundamental fact that comparatively few people are willing to accept the king's gracious gift. It went out to everybody, the highways and byways, everybody. But you know what? Very few came in. And those who came in, very few had the right 
state of mind very few wanted to put on, in the end, because of the statement, the robe of righteousness. Christian Service, page 41. It gets even more depressing. In a solemn statement that I make to the church, that not one in 20 whose names are registered on the church books are prepared to close their earthly history. And would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. How many, how many church members do we have here? How many church members? When you think of one in 20 in Ellen White's days, are we even on fire as the people in her time? May God help us. I would like us to characterize this man here who was thrown out into a place where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth because we're going to compare him in the next study with someone else who is naked, who does not have himself clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We'll, we'll deal with that in another study. So let's characterize this man who was thrown out. He's a person, right? He's one man, but he also represents a group, a group of people. Because in, in reality, a, a vast minority will accept the righteousness of Christ. So he is, he is one person. He could be you or me. But he's also there as part of a group, right? The people of Christ. God's church. He's, he's coming. He thinks he's good enough. This man, he's investigated by the king in the investigative judgment. And he's found to be improperly clothed. You could say he's naked. The, the, the sins are all open and exposed before God's eye. And why is he naked? Because he's not wearing the righteousness of Christ. So he refused the wedding garment. Also, you know, when the king comes to him, the king says, friend... You know, he, he addresses him in the most benign, kind, loving way. Friend, how did you get here? And how does this man answer him? Do you think he has a good excuse? He could say, well, you know, Lord, uh, I'm a good man. I've been a pastor all my life. I gave 50% of my funds to the poor. He, had, he, he was speechless. His own sins condemned him. There was nothing he could say. Another interesting thing. While this man represents a group... Is he with anybody? Is there anyone to defend him? He's totally, totally alone. And then, of course, the result is he's bound and cast away. The man who came to the feast without the wedding garment represents the condition of many in our world today. They profess to be Christians and lay claim to the blessings and privileges of the gospel. Yet they feel no need for transformation of their character. They have never felt the true repentance for sin. They do not realize their need of Christ or exercise their faith in Him. They have not overcome their hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing. So many times we, we live our life and we have all these weaknesses and it's, like, it's just the way I am. You know, I, I am like this. Like, it's not a bad thing. It's just... I can't help but be this way. But they never really feel the desire to change their character. She continues on. They think that they are good enough in themselves and they rest upon their own merits instead of trusting in Christ. Hearers of the word, they come to the banquet, but they have not put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. You know, today... Actually, I'm going to end the sermon on a pretty down note because this is how Christ ends his sermon. The next, the next verse talks about the taxes. Do we pay taxes to Caesar? This is how Christ left it. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. So my question is for each and every one of us. We are in the time of the investigative judgment. And we'll talk more about that next time. Are we clothed in the righteousness of Christ? Or are we found unclothed? Revelation 16.15 says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. 
Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. My wish and prayer for each and every one of us today is that as we see the time is short, the time is clothing, uh, closing, we look at ourselves and we look, am I clothed appropriately? And I would like us to compare, because the next person we talk about in the next topic, the next sermon, it is another man who is clothed improperly in the Old Testament. It's Joshua the high priest. And the little bit of hope I want to give you is he is also clothed in filthy rags. In fact, they look a lot more filthy than this man who was in his nice citizen dress. But there is a big difference between Joshua the high priest, still found in his worldly clothing, in his filthy rags. He has a totally different resolution, a totally different destination. And my wish and prayer for each and every one of us as we live through the investigative judgment that, first of all, we do not forget that we are right at the point where the king is, is investigating who is trying to enter into my feast, who is accepting my call to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And then may we also work on ourselves. How can I accept Christ's robe of righteousness? Amen.